Today we will be talking about the retina. Let's have a brief review of the anatomy of the retina and this is how it looks when you look inside your patient's eye. You can see the optic nerve in the disc. You can see blood vessels going out of it. Some of it are going up and some of it are going down. These are called the arcades. And at the very center of your patient's eyeball, you will see a very a dark spot called the macula. It's located at the very rear of your patient's eye. It's connected to the um, eyeball. It's connected to the very rear of your patient's eye. It has several layers, which we have discussed in our previous lecture. We will not go into much details anymore, but <clears throat> the, lay the, the retina is a very complicated tissue. It's not just a simple layer of tissue. It has several layers of both tissues and rods and cones. So how do you examine something that's at the back of your patient's eye? The most obvious would be using a direct ophthalmoscope, which is uniocular, meaning you can only use one eye at a time. And since you're using just one eye at a time, it doesn't give you stereopsis. Stereopsis meaning you don't see uh, its depth. You don't see um, a, a, it's a binocular um, image. You see something that's flat. It's an erect image. That means what's top is at the top and what's at the bottom is at the bottom. It has a high magnification of about 15 times the, uh, the, uh, the normal. And it has a small field of vision because you have a very high magnification. So it's a trade-off. When you see something that's very large, it usually will occupy the entirety of the image. Com this is how we use the examination you use the left eye to examine your patient's left eye and you set it usually at the red three and you start go trying to focus inside your patient's eye then you uh, if you're at the red three you just need to focus one click up or one click down and usually you will already be in focus except if your patient is a very high myope of your or you're examining children the other, the other um, way to examine the uh, the other way to examine the retina would be using an indirect ophthalmoscope, which, since you're using both eyes, has a binocular vision, and since you're using both eyes, it you can see uh, in uh, it's three D basically. Uh, stereop uh, there is stereopsis. You can see the depth and the uh, whether the uh, whether an in, an object is very deep and you see it basically in a 3d not just a flat image the image on this case would be inverted what's at top is actually at the bottom and what's at, la at the right is actually on the left it has a very low magnification only 5x and since it has a low magnification you can see more of the retina in just one look you can either examine the patient whether they're lying down or sitting up. Remember, the, uh, the, uh, the doctor here is holding a lens and focusing it in the eye because the indirect ophthalmoscope needs an external lens to be able to focus inside the patient's eye. The <clears throat> image would be inverted. What you can see at top is actually at the bottom. So you have an option of actually drawing everything as you see it so it doesn't confuse you or you invert the paper that you are drawing on such that you can uh, when you see something on the left uh, and you draw it on the paper the paper um, the paper would be just uh, inverted so when you put the paper right side up you will now be able to see it properly another option would be to use a slit lamp or a biomicroscope and a handheld lens. The, the lens will allow your mic, uh, your uh, your slit lamp to be able to focus inside, so you can change the magnification of what you can uh, of what you can see inside. Even though the lens would allow you a bigger um, a bigger image, 
your your slit lamp or your biomicroscope would allow you to actually change the magnification but like an indirect ophthalmoscope it will have an inverted image the fundus that you are looking at would usually look like this whenever you're trying to examine the patient's eye try to look for the landmarks in this case the optic nerve and the macula those are your landmarks you can follow the blood vessels all the blood vessels will lead you to the optic nerve and then from the optic nerve you can find the the macula which is about uh two uh, about two and two and a half uh disc diameters se uh, towards the center Now, there are other ancillary examinations or examinations that you can use to enhance your examination of the patient. The more commonly used right now is the optical coherence tomography or the OCT. The reason it's very, very useful, it, it allows you a view of your patient which you will usually not have. This is a, uh, it will give you a, a cross section of the patient's um, retina it, the machine does this by bouncing off a polarized laser and then measuring the degradation or how fast it's bouncing back or how slow it's bouncing back and in using uh, that information it can recreate the layers of what it passes through in this case the retina you can now identify the layers of the retina these are we, we were actually getting better and better octs the the newer generation octs can actually discriminate the different layers compared with the early octs which are uh, very very pixelized so right now you can actually try and see uh, the different layers which ones are being affected which ones are not which ones are uh, still okay and which ones are pathologic now the benefit of this is before the invention of the OCT you will only be able to see this if you do a cross section a dissection of your patient's retina that means the eyeball would have been removed and you would have brought it to the lab and sliced it to see the same layer the OCT allows you to do the same examination with a living patient without touching the eye Another time-tested procedure would be a fluorescein angiography. Be, uh, basically, it's an examination of your patient's blood vessel inside the retina. And it will show you problems with the blood vessels. You basically inject a dye and the dye is designed not to be able to escape the blood vessels. If it was able to escape a blood vessel like it's leaking, then you know that there's a pathology in that part and if there are various shapes like uh, very small capillary telangiectasias or microaneurysms differences in the shapes of your patient's blood vessels in the retina then you will be able to see it because the machine can magnify that certain area and you will now I, um, be able to identify which part are affected by a leaking blood vessel or an aberrant or abnormal blood vessel taking a fundus photo would also help you especially if you're not really very good with fundoscopy or you have not mastered fundoscopy yet you can actually request for a fundus photo the newer generation fundus cameras have a very very wide field such that you can not you can see not just the center but also the very very edges of the patient's uh, retina and if you don't have access to such a machine you can just um, <clears throat> take a fundus photo like this and then put it on top of the other photos such that you can have a composite of the entire retina by taking pictures from one uh, from one area and then putting it on top of the picture of the second area then you will have a more complete picture of the patient's eye in this case you can now see that there are problems at the very edges of the retina usually you will not be able to see this with a simple ophthalmos uh, with a simple um, 
ophthalmoscope, you will have to either press the side of the sclera so you'll be able to see at the very sides. Now let's go to the common problems that we encounter in the retina, the common pathologies. And the thing that comes to mind whenever you say uh, retina pathologies is diabetic retinopathy. Now diabetic retinopathy is basically a complication of diabetes. It's, um, it's basically uh, vascular changes in the retina and it starts after many years of diabetes. Now the key here is blood sugar control will help you in managing diabetic retinopathy. But you may reach a point wherein even if you control the blood sugar, your diabetic retinopathy has advanced so much that it is no longer listening to your bl uh, regular blood sugar. So you can control your blood sugar later on and the diabetic retinopathy will still get worse. But in the early stages, controlling your blood sugar would allow you to control your diabetic retinopathy. Now, there are several stages of diabetic retinopathy. The more common one, or the more, uh, the earlier one is called the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or NPDR. You will see uh, microaneurysms, usually in the very, very early stages. Microaneurysms are very, very small aneurysms, such that your blood vessels, sometimes you can see very, very small pockets, some very, uh, like it's has very, very small enlargements. Then you can see hemorrhages, you can see exudates, and you can see macular edema and areas of ischemia or areas where perfusion has stopped. Now, these um, symptoms have been arranged that uh, the earliest uh, ones you usually see are the microaneurysms and the later ones, uh, macular edema and the ischemia are usually seen in the later stages. Now, diabetic retinopathy, uh, the non-proliferative stage of diabetic retinopathy uh, is still, uh, can still be divided into several stages, but uh, let's not get into that anymore. The more severe part of diabetic retinopathy is when it becomes proliferative or PDR, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Here you see growth of blood vessels outside of the retina. They're actually... Uh, extending out of the uh, of the retina so from the retina they're now extending into the vitreous and first you would prob usually see neovascularization at the optic disc and then later on neovascularization at the other parts or we just call them neovascularization elsewhere they will look like this you can see the small blood vessels that are growing out. They're not normal. You saw the normal ones. You don't see those small fan-shaped small blood vessels or neovascularizations. And these vessels are abnormal. And abnormal vessels why might leak or contract. Now, diabetic retinopathy is usually not measured by the extent of the bleeding. You're looking for formation of new vascularizations because new vascularization is a signal that your diabetic retinopathy is now escalated and it will now become more difficult to control so this is how it looks like in pictures when you look at the your patient's eye you can see the small fronds the small blood vessels that are spread on the uh, all over the retina the more quadrants that are affected the more severe your new vascularization here you can see new vascularization both at the um, um, both at the area of the uh, optic nerve and in the other areas of the retina so this is a severe non prolif uh, severe prolifer uh, already a severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This slide will actually show you that time is very important when dealing with diabetic retinopathy. The longer that you have diabetes, the higher your chances of developing diabetic retinopathy. The type of diabetes also uh, is factored in. Uh, you will have a higher chance of having diabetic retinopathy 
if you have insulin dependent diabetes if you have if you are non insulin dependent then you can still have diabetic retinopathy but lesser compared to one needing uh, to the ones needing insulin the better your control with uh, of your blood sugar in diabetes the less the chance of your diabetic retinopathy coming in and the poorer you control your blood sugar the more aggressive your diabetic retinopathy will become again even if you have a very good control of your blood sugar eventually if you have diabetes long enough your diabetic retinopathy will come out so how do we manage this one we can do a pan retinal photocoagulation we usually do photocoagulation on the areas that are ischemic but recently the more success comes out with intravitreal injection of the anti uh, vegf or um, or injection of uh, this anti vegf into the eyeball itself they're very very effective in dealing with neovascularization it uh, actually doesn't matter whether you have a lot or a little neovascularization it's very very effective and it works very fast unfortunately uh, some patients would need multi multiple uh, injections of this medication for it to work on a long-term basis if you're already bleeding or your eye uh, your vitreous is already filled with blood or you're having problems with clearing all those bleeds that are coming out then you can uh, a surgery known as pars plana vitrectomy can be done to clear out those uh, stubborn clots or bleeding and enable your patient to see properly and you to be able to help take care of your patient's eye now there is also hypertensive retinopathy which sometimes goes hand in hand with diabetes uh, diabetic retinopathy for the same reason that a lot of patients with diabetes will have hypertension and a lot of patients with hypertension can have diabetes but they are not synonymous you don't have you don't automatically have hypertension if you have diabetes and the other way around now hypertensive retinopathy you are actually looking at the blood vessels you are see, uh, looking for changes in the way the blood vessels look and how the blood vessels interact if there are any leaks like hemorrhages or if there are any areas of ischemia like cotton wool spa, uh, spots and sometimes even swelling of the optic nerve because hypertension affects the precapillary arterioles and the capillaries for this uh, usually if you have hypertensive retinopathy and diabetic retinopathy at the same times at the same time everything is actually leveled up the the pathologies are actually more prominent because they affect the same areas the precapillary arterioles and the capillaries now one of the more commonly used uh, stages of um, classification is actually the modified Shea classification we have stage zero that means no changes you can't see anything then stage one there's a mild narrowing of the arterioles stage two you the, you, the arterioles uh, are now more uh, prominent in their changes they're more narrowed uh, you can see uh, an increased central light reflex of the blood vessels there will be intermittent constrictions in the blood vessels and AV crossing defects the, there will be changes when the blood vessels cross on top of each other because the blood vessels are now getting stiffer and they're now pressing on the other blood vessels that are underneath them you can see cotton wool patches in stage 3 hard exudates and hemorrhages and macular star stage 4 means your patient already has swelling of the optic nerve or papilledema so this is how um, some of the problems look you can see the blood vessels in their uh, crossing changes uh, some of them are constricted and you can also see here an early macular star which are basically leaks around of the blood vessels around the macula this is a macular star uh, basic uh, the those are it, it um soft uh, uh those are basically exudates around the macula you can see you can see here that the optic 
uh, disc is swollen, there's papilledema, so this is a stage 4 hypertensive retinopathy. Now, very, very important retinopathology that you need to, uh, to understand and learn is the central retinal artery occlusion or the CRAO. In this case, when you look at it and it's in the early stages, you can see what we call a cherry red spot. You can see the redness around the macula because the entire uh, retina doesn't have blood anymore. There's no perfusion, that's why it's becoming pale. The reason you can see a cherry red spot is because you can now see, you can see the perfusion in the choroid area. This is not perfusion of the retina, perfusion of the choroid area. What you can see here in the blood vessel is actually blood in the veins, not in the arteries. Now, CRAO is one of the true emergencies in ophthalmology. There are only two, uh, chemical, bur uh, chemical burns and CRAO. Be it's an emergency because you have 90 minutes, 90 minutes, to diagnose and relieve the embolus. So that's your golden period, the 90 minutes. It's usually due to an embolus in your central retinal artery. That's why it's uh, considered a stroke of your eye. Your patient will tell you there's a sudden loss of vision, very, very severe loss of vision uh, from something that they're seeing very clearly. And then within a few minutes, all of a sudden, everything is either blurred or it's everything is black. Most of the time, your patient will tell you they can still see light, but it's very, very blurred and it happened very, very quickly. Now, it may be followed later on by a stroke or an actual heart attack. So, if you have a patient with a CRA, uh, with CRAO, aside from trying to relieve the embolus, please refer them to a cardiologist or a, neuro, uh, 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 a neurologist such that that you need to be able to evaluate because some of these patients eventually will have a stroke or heart attack if you ignore their system. Now, how do you treat a patient with a CRAO? Usually, you have very, very little time to call for help. What you need to do is lower the eye pressure by giving anti-glucoma medications, usually mannitol, or ask the patient to inhale in a brown uh, paper bag. We call it brown bagging. Basically, the concept is you're trying to increase their intake of uh, carbo uh, of uh, CO2, of carbon dioxide. That usually will trigger a dilation in the blood vessels, hoping that the embolus would get dislodged and return perfusion. You could also massage the eyeball or do an anterior uh, paracentesis. Basically, put a small need, uh, needle um, with a small uh, syringe and aspirate a 0.1 uh, cc fluid from inside the front of the eyeball. Now, what you're trying to do is uh, decrease the pressure so that uh, the <coughs> the pressure uh, on inside the eye would um, would be able to move the embolus. Now, there is no guaranteed treatment for this, meaning even if you do all of these uh, maneuvers, you might still not be able to uh, dislodge the embolus. Okay, so once you have CRAO, prognosis for visual recovery is poor. The other thing is, a few months after your patient's CRAO, your retina will look normal. It will reperfuse but the retina is already dead. Okay, so the cherry red spot is present only in the first uh, few days to a few weeks, uh, and once reperfusion returns, it might look normal, but the retina is no longer functioning. The other one is CRVO, or central retinal vein occlusion. So it's the vein, the central vein that got blocked you can see bleeding all over, so it's basically like a high pressure, your uh, a high pressure system. Your ret your arteries are still pumping uh, blood inside the eye, but the drainage is no longer functioning. the 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 vein is blocked, so you you'll have bleeding all over the eye. You know it's a central retinal vein occlusion when the entire 
all four quadrants of your retina would have the bleed. It's a branch, rain, uh, branch uh, retinal vein occlusion when only one part will show the bleeding. So that means only one uh, branch became clogged, but the artery is still pumping in the fluids, the pumping in the, the blood. That's why you have all this breakage only in one area in a, in a branch. The entire, um, all four quadrants, if it's a central vein occlusion. Now, retinal detachment is also one of the problems that you might be dealing with in the retina. So, in this case, you notice the pale upper part and the normal looking lower part, the pale uh, outer part, is actually detached. It's no longer attached um, to the uh, RPE. So, it, uh, retinal detachment is when the RPE or the retinal pigment epithelium is separates from the rods and cones and there is accumulation of the fluid in the subretinal space. So, what it means is the retina is not just detached, there's fluid inside that's keeping the retina from reattaching itself. So, in order to remove, uh, in order to relieve the problem, you need to be able to drain the fluid at the back. You can do it medically or you can do it surgically. Now, you one of the things that you're looking for when you're checking a patient with retinal detachment is you're looking for the operculum because this will actually become a regmatogenous uh, retinal detachment, meaning there is a hole or a tear in the retina that means you need to isolate this area, you need to seal the area around it and drain the fluid and not just drain the fluid because if you just drain the fluid, fluid will actually return at the back of the, to, towards the back of the eye through the operculum. So you need to seal this area uh, and uh, seal this towards the, the sclera or the choroid. Another problem that usually gets a lot of attention is retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa is when you look inside your patient's eye and you can see bony spicules. This is like, um, this is like old photographs where you can see the pigments actually clumping. Retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic condition. Now, there has been several types of retinitis pigmentosa. Um, types have been identified some of it are uh, autosomal dominant autosomal recessive and sometimes sex linked so it depends a lot on which one your patient has and basically uh, what happens is your rod receptors uh, your rod receptor cells die off so remember you have two types of receptor cells rods and cones the cones uh, are for uh, color vision and very very good light uh, vision uh, when there is light and our rod receptors are basically your black and white receptors be, uh, more of uh, they're more sensitive to to dark uh, to um, at night time and retinitis pigmentosa is basically produced when you have a defect in a gene that encodes for rhodopsin now, retinitis pigmentosa is one of the more um, extensively um, uh, studied problems in the eye. And what you're, when you're looking at it, it actually gives you clumps of pigments. Now, unfortunately, there is also a type of retinitis pigmentosa wherein you don't see clumps of pigments, you see white. But uh, the more common presentation is retinitis pigmentosa, you see bony spicules, usually from the edges and then working their way towards the center because retinitis pigmentosa is usually um, progressive. So your patients will be telling you that they have nyctalopia or they have difficulty seeing in dark areas or night blindness. If you turn the light off in a room, they're actually practically blind. They have very poor peripheral vision because that's where most of your uh, rod, uh, that's where that area is usually populated by rod cells. Very few of your cones are there. And there is progressive contraction of the visual fields. That means your vis their vision will keep getting smaller um, as time goes. 
Unfortunately, there is no known treatment for retinitis pigmentosa. A very important um, retinal pathology for you to understand is called retinoblastoma. So you can, when you see a patient like this, you first thing that comes to your mind is that uh, the patient has cataracts. The patient has white in the eye, so it's probably cataracts. More often than not, you are correct. However, the more uh, the more important um, the, the more important thing that you need to differentiate from a cataract is retinoblastoma, especially if you see it in children. Now, it's the most common intraocular Im malignancy, and it's basically a mutation of the chromosome 13, which is a tumor, tumor suppressor gene. So it means you need to be able to have mutation in two of your, uh, in two of the, um, in two of your genes, one from your mother, one from your father, usually you will get one that's mutated and then the other one that's normal. In that case, there will be no um, no tumor. However, because of uh, what your retina is actually doing, it does, um, it does a lot of activity, especially when exposed to light, there might come a time wherein the normal gene would have a mutation because of the activity inside the retina and then both since both ret uh, both of your genes would now have uh, would have lost their suppression of the tumor then the tumor will come out again you will still survive if you have at least one that is still normal even if you have one that's abnormal but having a problem with the second one the normal one would now trigger problems and expression of your retinoblastoma. Now, <clears throat> when you see a patient with a retinoblastoma, you try to catch it before it reaches this stage. <clears throat> so you're looking at the pa uh, patient and your, your, um, your suspicion should be very, very, uh, should be triggered whenever you see Leukocoria, cat's eye, or white pupil in a child. More often than not, it's cataracts, but you need to be able to screen them out. Now, white pupil or cat's eye or leukocoria would be visible in about two-thirds of the patients with, with retinoblastoma. Not all. Sometimes, they would have strabismus or their uh, EOMs would be misaligned. Sometimes, they would have hypopion, which is actually the tumor that is being accumulated in front part of the eye and when your or when your retinoblastoma grows there be, uh, it becomes glucomatous the pressure goes up it becomes bophthalmos or your eyeball now starts to be uh, um, to enlarge bophthalmos basically means cow's eye if you remember if you see pictures of cows they have a very very big eyeball and when um, if the growth actually now becomes larger it becomes epsophthalmic and becomes an orbital mass so it could grow so large that it would now be out of the eyeball uh, sorry out of the orbit and uh, in this case more probably the uh, mo uh, most probably it has already escaped the eyeball and has infiltrated the areas in the orbit or probably worse now, retinoblastoma is a team management. That means don't try to manage one on your own. You need to get one. You need to get a pediatrician, uh, uh, preferably a uh, pediatric oncologist involved. You also will need help from a radiologic or oncologist in treating patients with retinoblastoma. Because when they're small, you may still have a chance. You can, uh, small, medium-sized uh, tumors, you can probably uh, do eye sparing methods, um, cryo, lasers, uh, brachytherapy, chemo, or sometimes even radiation therapy. But if it's more than half of the, uh, the size inside the eye, then probably uh, sight saving procedures would not be effective anymore and you will have enucleation. So your first priority saving the patient's life your second priority 
trying to save your patient's vision. The third priority is trying to save your patient's cosmetic um, um, uh, cosmetic concerns. So again, primary, save the patient's eye. This is an example of a, uh, a retinoblastoma treated with, lay, uh, uh, with a laser. Uh, so the before and after A is um, b uh, the tumor before the treatment and B is the, tru the, uh, the tumor after it has been treated. So there is still a chance to save your patient's eye. Um, second priority, if you can save the patient's eye, can, you can also try to save the patient's uh, vision. But in, in case that your tumor gets, uh, can get away, it's very, very aggressive and the uh, prognosis is actually very bad. Now, retinopathy of prematurity, as the name says, is a problem that you see in premature infants. It happens in um, infants uh, because they are born with their blood uh, retinal vessels are not yet complete and because of risk factors, they have not been able to complete their normal growth. <clears throat> now, this is an example of a retinopathy of prematurity. You can see in this area, there are no retinal blood vessels. The, the blood vessels stopped growing um, at this stage. You can see the delineation here. Um, so this part is abnormal. This is basically retina without the blood vessels, and this is the normal retina. So the risk factors that you're looking for is low birth weight. This is the most important one. Pay, uh, if your patients are less than one, uh, 1.5 kilos, <clears throat> your patients are very high risk for developing retinopathy of prematurity and have them uh, screened out. Now, if, the, uh, if a patient is born premature or less than 30 weeks of gestation, there's a very high chance of them developing retinopathy of prematurity. Now, being exposed to high unregulated oxygen at birth, especially since these are premature children, they're placed in incubators and given very, very high dose of oxygen. This could trigger a regression or a stoppage in the formation of the blood vessels inside the retina. And poor postnasal growth, meaning um, they, they're developing very, very poorly from the time that they, they were born. Uh, those risk factors actually increase their chances of having retinopathy of prematurity. Retinopathy of prematurity is not automatic. These risk factors allows you to identify which of your patients are now more high risk of developing this and you need to be able to catch them and monitor them very well. <clears throat> so again, a patient with retinopathy of prematurity, this area is... Uh, um, you can see the delineation in the um, uh, ROP in the, and this area is now starting to have a um, detachment which actually is what you're trying to avoid in retinopathy of prematurity. Later on, um, they develop very, very severe um, detachment. So how do you treat ROPs or retinopathy of prematurity? One is you can use lasers. Uh, argon and diode lasers, also very effective, is injection of the anti-VEGF, as, as we showed you earlier. So this is actually a picture of uh, a laser being applied on the areas to, uh, of the, without, the, um, without the blood vessels or the ischemic areas. What we're trying to avoid is the formation of uh, new vascularization and eventual um, detachment of the patient's retina. So that's all. If you have other questions, we can um, uh, answer them. Just put them in your comment section below so we can help you with them. Uh, also, uh, this is by in no way a complete treat, uh, a complete discussion of all the pro possible problems in the retina. But these are the major ones that you need to be aware of, especially if you're not an ophthalmologist, if even uh, if you're just uh, interested in the retina. These are the problems that you actually need to be able to understand very well. Thank you and have a good day.